Hi everybody, this is Dr. A, and in this video we're going to look at special collections, so things that we might need uh, special considerations for the type of specimen, uh, type of collection that it is. So this is therapeutic drug monitoring, uh, oral glucose tolerance test, blood culture, and uh, several others. Okay, so let's start with therapeutic drug monitoring. So um, with um, therapeutic drug monitoring, part of the reason why it's done is uh, for those specific drugs, there is a, a very small window between therapeutic and toxic, and patients do differ greatly at, in the rate at which they metabolize or excrete medications. And so to maintain constant therapeutic plasma drug levels and to make sure that the drug does not become toxic, the patient may require some time specimens to me measure the medication levels uh, and maybe even potentially to adjust dosage. So the collection is usually timed to coincide with either the trough or the peak serum level. So the trough is going to be the level at which uh, the blood uh, level of the drug is going to be the lowest. So trough is low and then peak is the highest. So uh, a trough is often drawn right before the next dose is given because that's the point at which it's going to be the lowest. And then the peak is usually drawn at an interval after the medication has been given, depending on the, the type of intake, depending on if the medication is given through an IV or orally, there's going to be a different type of window for basically maximum absorption and circulation in the blood. And that's what you want to catch. That would be the peak level. And so, um, when exactly the peak, the, the, it depends on the medication, the patient's metabolism, the method of administration, all of that. So you would have peak levels are high, trough levels are low. And with a uh, repeated dose, you know, the patient goes peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough. And they may not do it for every dose. So some of the antibiotics, they may do it every third infusion uh, to check, and part of that is because uh, if they reach toxicity level, it can be damaging to the liver or to the kidneys or to their eyesight or to their hearing. Um, so it's important to keep a check on all that. Okay, so diabetes testing. There are four types of diabetes, type 1, type 2, gestational, and diabetes that's caused by other causes, and uh, the diagnoses of diabetes or prediabetes relies on the results of four tests, uh, really one or two, um, I'll tell you which one. So first of all, your glycated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C. This is a really good screening test for diabetes. The other one is either a fasting or a random glucose. Um, and so all those together can already point you very quickly into type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and those are the ones that are the most used. However, uh, the older oral group glucose tolerance test um, is still being used in maternity clinics for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. Um, and so it's, it has a use there. It used to be used to diagnose type 2 or possibly even type 1 diabetes, but it's just has fallen out of favor. It takes a long time. The A1C and the fasting glucose and random glucose is way faster, way easier to do. So it's generally been replaced with that. So what is this oral glucose tolerance test? So it measures the change in blood glucose after drinking a very sweet drink solution. So it is a specific drink. You can't just, they can't just come with their own Coke or Sprite or whatever and drink it. So um, they, it's uh, uh, an orange usually, sometimes lemon lime flavor, um, and it has a certain load of glucose in it. Um, so uh, women have to come in, the pregnant women is usually who, who does these oral glucose tolerance tests will come in fasting. And uh, you draw a, a glucose sample fasting, and then you give them their proper dose of the drink, and they need to drink it pretty quickly. So you need to down that drink, very, very sweet. It really tastes like some soda that has been concentrated too much. And then you have to draw their blood at uh, an hour for a glucose level and two hours for the two-hour glucose tolerance test. So this is the quickest one. There is also a three-hour and a five-hour. I've hardly ever seen a five-hour done, but two and three hours are pretty common. And so on the three-hour, you do another level at three hours. 
And the idea is if the patient is not diabetic, um, first their fasting glucose is going to be normal, but the glucose at one hour should be probably still high. And then by two hours post a dose, it should have come back down to normal. And uh, if it doesn't, and if at two hours it is still elevated, then that can indicate gestational diabetes. Next, we have blood cultures. So a blood culture is ordered to detect a presence of microorganisms in the blood, which is uh, a potentially life-threatening situation where a patient has developed sepsis. Uh, such microorganisms are going to include bacteria, fungi, and protozoans that can be detected. Uh, the bacteremia refers specifically to the presence of bacteria in the blood. And septicemia is a life-threatening infection that's caused by a rapid multiplication of the pathogens in the bloodstream. Um, patients with symptoms of chills and fever, or they have a fever of a known origin, um, may require a blood culture draw. So there are three basic types of containers for collecting blood cultures. There are the long neck bottles, uh, which accepts the BD vacutainer needles and tube holders. So you can put them straight on there on the needle adapter systems. Uh, there is a shorter bottle, which accepts the winged infusion device with that uh, a specific collection uh, adapter that's wide, right? Uh, and uh, they, it's the BD back deck device uh, brand and again it has a special adapter that fits the top of these bottles um, and then you have a standard evacuated tube with sodium polyethanol sulfonate SPS and tacoagulant I do not have it portrayed here it is usually a pretty thick about 10 mil tube with a um, light yellow top and um, some clear liquid inside of it so you need to use proper antiseptic preparation of the skin, which reduces the presence of the normal skin flora, which could contaminate the blood culture sample. This reduces the risk of false positive and is probably the more and most important step of the entire procedure. So you can use an alcoholic preparation of iodine or a povidone iodine or a chlorhexidine gluconate, which is often called chloroprep. I believe that's just a brand. Uh, those are the preferred antiseptics. So it's either an iodine, but it could be allergic to iodine prep, or it's a chloroprep. Um, chloroprep has pretty much been the one that's been the most widely used. It may come in an applicator that looks like this, but there are various looks of the different applicators. So the number of organisms in the bloodstream is often the highest just before a spike in the patient's temperature. Uh, by frequently recording the temperature, these spikes can often be predicted and then a collection scheduled accordingly. So the contamination of the sample by skin bacteria is a frequent complication of the blood culture collection because then the, the physician needs to decide whether this is a contaminant or truly an infection because skin bacteria, if introduced into the bloodstream, could cause a blood infection. So, uh, you know, distinguishing true um, pathogens from contaminants can be difficult um, because those, again, those contaminants could grow on the indwelling devices, on IVs, uh, ports, central lines, etc. So they could cause infection in a patient. So to reduce errors that are caused by this contamination, um, a known skin contaminant must be cultured from at least two different sites to be considered a blood pathogen. So this is why we do two different blood culture sets from two different sites, is to be able to distinguish whether if a bacteria is identified as normally a skin contaminant, is it truly causing an infection or was it simply uh, improperly collected or improperly uh, cleansed at the site of collection. So after identifying the site of the phlebotomy, uh, you want to prepare it by scrubbing it vigorously with alcohol first to clean the first one and a half to two inches beyond the intended puncture site. And then you follow that by scrubbing vig vigorously with 2% iodine on a, uh, or a povidone iodine swab stick. Uh, you have to absolutely 100% avoid touching the site once it has been cleansed and you want to let it dry for at least one minute. So you will want to remove the tourniquet, not leave the tourniquet on and then reapply the tourniquet, but they need to keep their arm uh, outstretched and not move it. 
then uh, as that is drying, you want to make sure you have all your collection equipment, all your bottles, etc. You want to clean the tops of the collection bottles with either iodine or alcohol, and then place a clean alcohol pad on top of each bottle until it is inoculated. By the way, those bottles each have a top that has to be removed from it, uh, kind of like a medicine top of a bottle. So it needs to be removed, uh, and then it sh you should see uh, a rubber top uh, gasket thing, a rubber that can be punctured by a needle. That's what needs to be uh, cleansed with alcohol. And um, immediately before an inoculation of the bottle, you do want to wipe the top off with the alcohol pad to make sure that it's been freshly cleaned. And uh, you want to collect the sample. You need uh, minimum five meals, up to 10 meals in each bottle. 10 meals is ideal. 12 is the maximum that you can put in one bottle. So you need that in each bottle. Most uh, sets have aerobic and anaerobic bottles, so you would need at least, you know, 10 to 20 mils to go to get a full set. You always want to draw, uh, to put the blood in the aerobic bottle first. That is the green or the blue one, depending on which type of bottle you have. And then you want to fill the anaerobic, which is either orange or purple in color, again, depending on the brand. They're all also indicated on the bottle which one's aerobic and anaerobic, if you're not sure. Uh, once you have your bottles that are properly filled and you remove the needle uh, and help pressure, you attend to the patient to make sure that bleeding has stopped and that, uh, you know, everything is good. So uh, next we're going to mention therapeutic phlebotomy, uh, although it's not likely that you will do it, it is a possible. So it's a removal of blood from a patient's system as part of the treatment for a disorder. Um, so some of the disorders that can be treated by therapeutic phlebotomy are going to be polycythemia, being too many red cells basically, uh, hemochromatosis, so having, having too much iron. So uh, polycythemia, hemochromatosis are more likely in males. Um, and in both cases, a periodic removal of a unit of blood can be part of the treatment program. Then it you know, helps alleviate the excess amount of iron or uh, red cells in the blood. This can actually be accomplished by simply donating blood on a regular basis, especially if the patient is an eligible donor. Next, we have cold agglutinins. So these are antibodies that are formed in response to an infection with mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, it is a cause of atypical pneumonia, also often called walking pneumonia. And uh, the antibodies that are created by the immune system during the infection can also react with red cells at temperatures below body temperature. And it causes the red cells to stick together, and this is why they are called cold agglutinins. So with, when the blood gets cold, it agglutinates or sticks together. Uh, and agglutination is a process of cells sticking together. Because the agglutinins attach to the red cells at cold temperatures, the specimen must be kept warm until the serum is separated from the cells to avoid falsely lowering the agglutinin levels, if that's what you're trying to detect or it needs to be kept warm and run warm if you're trying to get a CBC blood count because the problem is with the cells sticking together is they're not going to be counted appropriately and you're going to get some really, really weird results on your CBC. Uh, ideally, you need to pre-warm the tubes before collection and then keep them warm after collection. There are different ways to keep them warm. You can uh, keep them warm in your hand. You can put them in a bag and kind of put them under your arm to keep them warm. There are some, I've seen some sand incubators or other types of incubators that can be uh, taken with you. Um, so either way, usually you do not want to delay delivery to the lab and you want to keep the specimen warm the entire time. So sometimes you need to put the specimen on ice. Uh, and so there are a number of tests that require that the specimen is chilled immediately after collection. And this is to suspend the levels of certain chemicals that we're looking for. And uh, if it is not chilled, then those uh, test results can vary very quickly. Um, the sample should be placed on crushed ice or in an ice and water mixture and immediately delivered to the lab. So the fact that you have ice and water will allow the chilling of the specimen to happen uh, quicker. 
And uh, testing needs to happen usually within 30 minutes. Uh, you really do not want to delay testing. So um, specimens that typically need to be chilled and put on ice, especially if you cannot test them like, right away. Like at ABG, you might be able to test it if you have a point of care device or a device that's like within a minute or two of the patient. You could potentially just pull the specimen and go straight to run it. But if there's going to be a delay, like if it takes you 10, 5, 10 minutes to get to the lab, then you want to put it on ice. And so ABGs need to put on ice, ammonia levels and lactic acid levels. All of those need to be put on ice until they can be tested. And they need to be tested as soon as they uh, arrive in the lab. There are also light sensitive specimens. So exposure to light can break down or alter certain blood constituents. Um, specimens to be tested for these constituents have to be protected from light after collection. You can do this by wrapping the tube in aluminum foil immediately after collection, especially if the collection tube is not a light uh, opaque tube. Um, you can use an amber colored microtube. Uh, this can be used for dermal collections. For example, the bilirubin samples for the neonatal bilirubin. This is what it looks like, and this is light blocking. Uh, and the ones that you need to be the most concerned with uh, being light sensitive are going to be your bilirubin samples, porphyrin testing, and um, most of your vitamins are very light sensitive. And then we're going to talk about legal and forensic specimens. So um, blood specimens may be collected to use as evidence in legal proceedings. This could include alcohol and drug testing, especially if there was a wreck or something that happened, DNA analysis or paternity or parentage testing. The most important concept in handling forensic specimens is the chain of custody. So that's a protocol that ensures that the sample is always in the custody of a person that is legally entrusted to be in control of that specimen. So the chain begins with the patient identification and you know, properly identifying the patient. It usually requires a form of ID like a driver's license, and then it continues through every step of the collection and testing process. Everybody that handles a specimen plus the donor of the specimen, so the patient, have, has to sign the chain of custody form. And so the chain of custody documentation can include special containers that have seals, that have temperature gauges on them, uh, special forms uh, that have signature lines and stuff, and you have to have the date, time, and identification of each handler of the specimen. So that, you know, the if it's a blood draw, the phlebotomist may have to sign it but then the courier that picks up the specimen, maybe if it goes to a different location, would have to sign and date it. And then the person receiving that specimen, maybe at the reference lab, has to sign it. They're processing it in. The person that is going to test the specimen has to sign it. So if anybody puts their hands on the specimen or does anything with the specimen, their name needs to be on that chain of custody form. So the purpose and procedure of the test must be explained to the patient. The patient has to sign a consent form. They have to present a picture identification. Uh, the specimen has to be labeled appropriately to establish a chain of custody. They're usually labeled in front of the patients, and the patient often has to uh, initial the seal or um, you know, somewhere on the specimen to uh, show that they indeed agree with that. Uh, so. Uh, the reason you seal it is to show uh, any tampering so that the first person to unseal that specimen should be the one testing it. And if the seal was broken, then somebody may have tampered with the specimen along the way. The specimen should be placed in a locked container before transport to the testing site, again, so that it cannot be stolen or tampered with. Uh, and the recipient must sign for the delivery of the specimen. So everybody that touches the specimen have to sign. They have to sign the specimen form, the uh, chain of custody form. So the last one we're going to talk about is going to be the legal alcohol collection. So this often occurs um, in the emergency department, and there's usually been a wreck of some sort, especially if um, they're driving um, some, you know, public transport or something that's under the DOT, but either way, uh, they can request a legal blood alcohol test. Um, so this collection requires special handling to prevent the alteration of the test results. The site cannot be cleaned with alcohol because that could falsely elevate the results. So instead of alcohol, you can use soap, water, sterile gauze, or another non-alcoholic antiseptic solution to clean the site. 
The tubes must be filled as full as the vacuum will allow to minimize the escape of alcohol from the specimen into the space above. It is often collected into a gray top tube. Um, and you need to note on the requisition form that the site was cleansed with soap and water in another non-alcoholic solution. It will often have a chain of custody form that goes with it. Depending on your protocol procedures, that you may then actually have to give that specimen forms and everything after you've collected it to the law enforcement individual and they take it for forensic testing they would sign for it etc so uh, it's very important to buy that all the protocols because you may be called to testify in court and you need to of course have abided by the protocols that have been set in place by your institution so all right well that wraps up all of these special collections thank you